My name is Sophie. I suffered from fibromyalgia and extreme fatigue syndrome for about 24 years. Today I'm fully healthy. And now I would like to pass on everything I've learned about health and healing and more to support those who are still on a journey. And this is why I create this documentary series and podcast, The Puzzle of Healing. Hi everyone, welcome to a new episode of The Puzzle of Healing. Today I talk to Pamela Rose. She is a fatigue coach. Someone I really wish I would have had on my own journey, but I'm very glad she's here now. She's doing what she's doing. And the even more brilliant thing is, she also speaks from experience. She does know what it feels like. She's been through it. She fully recovered and now she's out there helping others. I think she's really, really inspirational and I hope you take a lot of hope and positive things from this episode. Having said all that, please bear in mind, there is no quick fix. It does take time and effort, but the good news is change and recovery are both possible. If you want to get in touch with her, as always, have a look in the description. She's very happy to answer questions if you want to reach out to her. And one little note about this episode, we had some technical jittery. The audio is all right. The picture might be a little, little get stuck here and there. So I hope that is not too irritating. Other than that, enjoy this episode. Hi, Pamela. Thank you so much for having the time to join me today. <laughs> How are you doing? It's, I'm good, thank you. It's lovely to be here. Lovely to see you. I'm really, really excited about this episode because when I was still Ella, I really wish I would have had someone like you. So, and I hadn't. So that's why I'm really excited to kind of share about your background of like you as a coach, but also like your own journey with CFS. So before I give too much mm -hmm. away, do you just want to introduce yourself? <laughs> sure. Yes, of course. So I'm Pamela, Pamela Rose. I'm a fatigue coach. So um, uh, I help people who have got a fatigue related health challenge on their hands. Um, yeah, um, I live in Bristol, UK, but I help people all over the UK and, and indeed um, overseas as well. Oh, lovely. So that uh, can all work on Zoom then, I guess, or online calls. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, you know, I, uh, because of the people that I help most of my work was online anyway um uh even before uh you know 2020 hit um but uh but but yeah it it it's meant that it's kind of uh made it that bit more accessible for people uh, overseas as well I think that's really fantastic I definitely would love to talk a lot more about how you're coaching but first of all like how did you how did you get to being a coach what what's your story <laughs> Well, do you know, it's interesting, Sophie, you, you saying that, that, you know, you wished you'd had somebody like me when when you needed me. I wish I'd had somebody like me, too, <laughs> which is a bit of an odd thing to say because I am me. But, but you know, um, I myself was diagnosed with ME CFS uh, 13 years ago now and, um, you know, found myself in a very, very difficult situation situation as as many of us do um and 13 years ago you know there's not much help around now there was even less then yeah. we didn't have instagram youtube um you know didn't even have those sorts of places to access community support and, and advice and what have you um and i yeah i as i got i'm sure we'll talk a bit more about it but as i got through my own journey and started to feel you know um stronger and more energetic I I really just felt this this pull to give people what I'd needed back then that, that wasn't there and and here I am and you know I I get huge huge joy from it that's amazing so are you still suffering from it are you fully recovered what's where are you no, at no um I I, uh, I consider myself fully recovered now uh, for five years. Oh, five so years already. Oh, that's uh, amazing. So my journey took seven years from, well, it's it's interesting, isn't it? You know, where do you, where's the start and the end point? Um, mm. Although I, you know, the, 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 the acute, shall we say, uh, onset of, of the um, ME CFS happened uh, 13 years ago. In hindsight, 
it had been, you know, I'd been sort of sliding into it for, for a good period of time before that. But I mark it from when life had to stop, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Uh, and, and that was seven years. I think that is quite interesting when you say you said you were sliding in and then there was like when your life had to stop. Can you pinpoint when you started sliding in? Like what 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 was that journey? And what brought well, it then to I a mean, hold? Yeah, so I mean, I was um, I was in my late 30s when, you know, the acute stopping bit happened. But, you know, in my early 20s, I had glandular fever. Um, and, you know, I'd always been prone to illness and, and throat infections and things after that time. Um, many you know, frequent bouts of tonsillitis and, mm. you know, I, I'd get back, but, but, but I was always, and that just started to get worse and worse. And then I'd have these, these episodes where I'd think I was coming down with something. And so I'd rest up for a day and feel much better. So I'd get back to life, you know, normal life. And then a few days later, I'd think, oh no, I'm, I'm fighting it off again. Now, I suspect those were sort of mini many you know fatigue flares but but, but I as many people don't I, I had no idea um yeah. uh, that that was what was going on and I was in hindsight I was pushing through um so you know I really from definitely from my mid-30s early mid-30s um you know people at work would would almost joke that I was the barometer if there was something going around a bug a cold or a, a virus of some sort you'd know because I I'd be the first to get it oh, no. you know my system my system was clearly just so compromised and mm. uh, you know honestly if I was ill they knew to be careful because there was something doing the rounds and I don't know if this is a fair question or possible to answer but when you now say you pushed through do you think that massive crash where everything came to a hold would have been preventable if you wouldn't have pushed through or is that something impossible to say yeah it, it, actually no if we'd been talking a few years ago i'd have said um mm, it was probably inevitable but 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 from what i know now um absolutely if somehow i'd really uh, i'd known and i knew what to do and i knew the importance and i knew the the things to prioritize in life um you know in, in, in a smarter way at least mm -hmm. um no I probably could have um could have protected myself uh found that kind of sense of robust good health that I'm in now and and focus on keeping it but I think it, it's just not that straightforward is yeah <laughs> and as it for, for many of us and as you say, it's a tricky one because I guess most people in that state probably would have no clue because probably the doctors wouldn't even get to that idea either yet. So I guess it's just maybe a generally good note that we should not just ignore our bodies and just push through when something is up, no matter what we call it at that state. Well, you know, and I try to do a little bit. I mean, I prioritise my time in helping people that have got fatigue-related health challenges. But, you know, every now and then I do get asked to share perhaps some guidance and wisdom, you know, on the more preventative side. I, I actually spoke to a, um, a group earlier this week called, uh, sorry, last week called, um, they're, they're called the Busy Working Mums mm -hmm. um, group, which, you know, it, as, as you guess, it's, it's, it's people who are working, they've got young children, life's really busy. And, and it was all about helping them recognise when it's important to, find time to to rest and that just small small changes can make quite a difference so uh um yeah you know there are important messages yeah to, to get from that we all become so much wiser about how to look after ourselves and uh and making the right priority calls don't we once we've come through a journey like this and it's a shame that we've had to have done the journey to get that wisdom <laughs> True. And also, like, I think I need a reminder sometimes again, because then now I'm fully healthy, I can do whatever I want. And I enjoy my life so much that I start to do more and too much again. So I kind of need that reminder again. Because like the first year after I recovered, I remember I was so good with like everything, sleep hygiene, diet, everything you could think of, times off for breaks. And now it's just like, I've forgotten half of it. <laughs> so for me, it's uh, also like a good reminder to come back to it and not to forget it. So I think it's really good. Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, 
uh, protect where you've got to. You know, that's what I suggest to people that they they recognise just what a wonderful place they've now got back to and the importance of protecting protecting yeah. where they are. Absolutely. So what happened then? What was the big crash for you that grounded everything to a halt? Well, for me, it was always sort of this upper respiratory kind of space that I was particularly prone to suffering from. And um, like I said, bouts of tonsillitis, lots of antibiotics, lots of things like that. And then I had, um, you know, it, 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 back in uh, 20, uh, sorry, 2009, I had this what I thought was another bout of tonsillitis, but it turned out to be an abscess on my tonsils. Mm. Um, it's called a Quincy, sits behind your tonsils. You can't see it, but you can feel it. Um, and it was misdiagnosed because they often are. Um, and it got quite bad by the time, actually, I don't know whether I've said this before, but at the time I had a friend who was a, a, a surgeon at a, a, a local hospital and I was texting her saying how poorly I felt. And, but gosh, this tonsillitis was, you know, it just wasn't shifting and I could hardly sort of, um, I couldn't even swallow saliva. You know, I, my throat was so, so swollen and I was having trouble starting to breathe. And she, she said, get, get to A&E, that's a quinzing. Um, oh, wow. And thank goodness she did because, you know, I went in and they ambulanced me to another hospital with the ENT ward and I was in there for... Um, five or six days getting you know intravenous ant uh, antibiotics pumped into me nice big needles stuck into the back of my throat to oh. extract all of the it wasn't fun I it doesn't sound fun <laughs> so you know I had the the infection but then I had the antibiotics I had the the stress the tra trauma to be quite honest with you it wasn't a fun thing to go yeah. through um so that was the that was the beginning, I think. Uh, that's my marker. Um, and then um, I I did have to have my they recommended I have my tonsils removed because once you've had this sort of abscess once, the chances are it will happen again. And I didn't want to go through that again. So mm -hmm. at the age of um, uh, thirty nine, I had my tonsils out, which is quite old to have your tonsils out. Um, and unfortunately, I was one of the unlucky ones that it it the post op healing didn't go well, and I was rushed back to hospital by ambulance in the middle of the night. Um, and uh, I'd lost half my blood in a couple of hours and they had to rush me back into surgery to, to be stitched up again. Um, From and that was when my body just went. Mm. The, oh, wow. the, where they'd removed it, they, they cauterized the wound and, and mine had got infected because I was my immune system was so bad that it opened up again. And I woke up in the middle of the night with, you know, blood everywhere um all a bit dramatic sorry for anybody <laughs> listening who doesn't like hearing these stories but you know it it, it it was a defined shall we say a defined um start you can see now why I consider that the kind of um the start the period of it, that, yeah. that, you know uh the starting point for my for my recovery journey um but do you know what there were kind of good things about it in that there was the definition you know, mm -hmm. I, I, um, I'd managed to go back to work after my Quincy and, and for the few months between that and um, my tonsil op. I wasn't right. I can remember we worked in a big, I worked for a, a big, a, a bank, a big corporate building. And I was having to walk so slowly, even just to get to the toilet. It was, you know, down the end of a long corridor and I was walking so slowly and I just didn't feel myself. But I was there because I didn't know. You know, I just was hopeful that once I had my tonsils out, everything would be fine. Yeah. And I, I said bye to my colleagues on the Friday to go and have the op done at the beginning of the next week. And they didn't see me again for a year because I, you know, wow. um, uh, after the the blood, uh, blood loss and having to be whisked back into surgery, that was when my body just stopped me. Just, no, you know, can't, we can't carry on sort of thing yeah um, and so yeah. but but it did the definition sorry to, to finish what I was saying sorry the the definition the, the benefit of that defined thing is that it was recognized very quickly that 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 what was going on that I had this um MECFS type um health challenge on my hands and so at least I didn't have that period of knowing something was wrong and nobody taking me seriously or, or, or what have you 
Yeah. So, but I guess it was still like a few months because obviously there's like this this typical marker of like I think it is four to six months. If um, nothing else can be found, then it is MECFS. So it mm. still must have been a period without knowing, so this, right? This, this was yeah. It was sort of autumn of two thousand and nine, and it was um, sort of springish twenty ten mm -hmm. that I. Um, I think there's a gosh, it, it, it feels like a long time ago now. Um, I think those are the right years. Anyway, um, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Because I, and then and then of course um, I was referred to um, a consultant to get it formally sort of diagnosed at the local hospital. Although I was referred to the pain clinic um, back then, that was the closest sort of fit mm -hmm. that you know the NHS and, and hospitals had for these sorts of challenges. I, I didn't actually have pain as one of my signature symptoms, um, but but it was the pain clinic that, that diagnosed me. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, that is hopefully something that has changed. I mean, specifically with long COVID, I would hope that there are now more specialised clinics popping up more and more and more people who are actually aware of yeah. what's going on. Yeah. Um, and of course, that's both a good and a bad thing. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's horrible that they're needed. But I do think that at least from a diagnostic um, point of view, it's a lot. The process is perhaps a bit easier now. Um, as far as then what happens after that, I'm not sure an awful lot's changed. But yeah. Yeah, of course. There's still the question if a medical professional would would say that you can recover because that is still a very tricky tricky question <laughs> we see people who can clearly recover recover we are both one of them two of them but um it is still debated so it is very interesting so I before people, we move on I to people. exactly sorry um i just want to say we do have a bit of a audio video delay i hear you very clearly but the video stucks in between if it's all right with you i would just continue because i hear you very clear just so you're aware or would you is that yeah you it's happening change? a bit with you as well okay. and i don't know i've got a full signal i don't know then why let's just it's keep going it. because the audio is clear i can clearly hear you so it shouldn't be too much of a problem okay all right then to the lovely bit you did recover so what happened how did you do that <laughs> um there were no um miracle cures or you know quick fixes is um it was uh learning and learning how to how to give my body the best possible chance of um doing whatever it needed to do you know i sort of intuitively knew that my body needed to kind of get figure this out itself and that i needed to give it the best possible chance of doing that so it was it was about reading about, you know, researching about nutrition, um, supplementation, energy management. Um, there wasn't an awful lot of help around at that point, but there were bits and pieces. And um, my then boyfriend, uh, now husband, um, was was also a, a huge support in, in researching and looking into sort of what, what was sort of thought to help. Um, so, it was really about primarily looking after myself a lot more, giving myself a bit of um, space and time. I was lucky that I did get paid leave from work um, mm -hmm. for a period of time. Um, and I, yeah, uh, you know, it was, it was largely about looking, looking after myself. Um, as I then started to get a bit more stability and feel as though my system was starting to restore, um, I did then, start to do some other things I I um I swore by reflexology I still mm -hmm. see her today and I I would credit Louise with being one of the, the hugely helpful people that um just gave me that and gave my system the support it needed as it as it was going through um so I did start to try a few um other um helpful things that might have boosted my uh, my recovery but but on the whole it was as we hear still today pacing eating well keeping yourself as driven and positive as as possible and just knowing just knowing that I was going to get through it yeah that's I just amazing knew. that is I think that is that is so good and I I understand everyone who can't manage that positivity but I think it is so crucial to just have that strong mm -hmm. self-belief. I think that is wonderful that you managed to keep that. 
and and I was very lucky, you know. I am um, in hindsight, my my mum was very much a very positive person, and and you know, I I that had been, you know, it, it was very much inbuilt with me in me. Um, and I, it wasn't until I started to help people professionally that I realised that perhaps I'd taken that element for granted a bit. Um, yeah. Now, professionally, it's absolutely one of the things that I help people with is to, you know, find ways to, you know, get into that determined, disciplined and constructive way at looking at this um, and, and help them figure out what they need to do um, and, and get that hope back that, they will get through it it's just and and you know I didn't have any answers of course um but I tried to get into this sort of cute I talk about my favorite word curiosity a lot but I was sort of curious about okay well I'm going to get through this let's see how and, and when it's a wonderful word it's kind of the word that is in my job really really interesting like really important because as an actress and a writer I'm constantly curious about mm. something and so I, I love that word. It's a it's a wonderful, playful word. And I think, it isn't there a thing is, where you say absolutely. you can't be curious and anxious at the same time? Something like this. So it also helps to yeah. kind of fight other negative emotions when you manage to be curious about. Well, that. and I I think as a in life in general, but certainly when you're you're experiencing a health challenge, if you're trying anything new or you're trying to get into a frame of mind to do something, you know, being curious is much it's. Otherwise, it's, you can be much more sort of um, extreme about, you know, success and failure, right and wrong, um, you know, that the sort of black and white bits. Whereas if you're curious about something, if it doesn't work out quite as you'd hoped, you're more, um, you're more able to sort of think, okay, well, I'll put that to one side and I'll, I'll try something else. You know, it, it's, yeah. it's a much more helpful state to be in. That's very true. Before we move on to how you work as a coach, would you like to explain a little bit of like what reflexology is and how that works? Oh, okay, sure. I mean, it's um, I'm not an expert, but Fair it's, enough. <laughs> um, it's 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 working at acu acupressure points on your feet. Um, and um, although I was quite, um, I like to think before this kicked off that I was quite open. I, I naturally quite um, interested in holistic therapies and alternative therapies and things like that and uh but you know I I embraced that even more um during my own personal journey and reflexology was one of those things and and now I think it's it's much more uh widely sort of accepted as something that can be helpful but the point being that she would I mean it was it was terribly relaxing as well it was blissful she would I found somebody who would come to my house which was perfect so I because the first six months I was I was housebound pretty much you know mm -hmm. I, I really I really couldn't um, do much at all so she would come to me and she brought her kind of chair thing that I would lie back in and it was so relaxing but also she'd work different parts of my feet which were helping um, to ease some of my symptoms but also encourage um, perhaps some of the more energy you know uh, the, the parts of my body that were really uh, important for me making energy and making sure that things were going as efficiently as they possibly could and I mean I I can't explain how it works but it was so interesting she'd say you know she'd pick up on things like oh your left knee feels a bit crunchy or your you know your right ear or something and I'd be I'd be thinking you know how does she know that <laughs> it, it's fascinating stuff but I it didn't fix me I don't think that I don't think that there are any things that can just fix this necessarily um but did it help? As I say, I said before, it helped. I just felt it gave my body a helping hand every week to just get through it. And I mm -hmm. think that, you know, it's about figuring out. For me, reflexology was one of those things. I also went for um, craniosacral therapy, which I, I really I find hugely helpful. That's where they, they work your sort of your, your, your cranium and your, your, your sacral um and very small movements and it's again it's about encouraging your your whole system to sort of mm -hmm. find a bit more stability um that's really interesting I did I did it, have you know, that other people... oh sorry for delay um I was about to say yeah I have that I had that as a child and for me it was exactly the opposite for me it would trigger more fibromyalgia pain um today I love it today I love yeah. uh, osteopathy yeah. and cranio and stuff like that but it is interesting as and you said isn't, different bodies isn't need that... different things 
isn't that an interesting point? You know, I talk about helping people figure out the right blend of things for them. Mm -hmm. um, you talk about the puzzle of healing, and I think that's a wonderful, uh, you know, description. But but literally, everybody's um, blend, everybody's puzzle pieces are are different. And um, and I see time and time again that what helps one person um, either you know does nothing for somebody else or or indeed they they quickly find that it it just really isn't right yeah and that they have to recognize that to put that to one side so how do you work with people if someone comes to you how do you start so um picking up on on a point i made just just there really you know no two no two experiences of um fatigue are the same and no two people are the same uh, from from um, my point of view as a as somebody that helps them um, so the first thing I'll, I'll always do is is get to know their experience you know what are um, a little bit about you know of course what's caused them to find themselves in this particular situation but 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 mainly about how's life for them just now um, I very much my space um, or the, the space that I primarily fill is helping people you know pick them up from where they are now help them figure out that blend of things that is going to help them and be and then I, I guide them and I stay with them for for a little while depending on how long um we have together um until they've truly become you know pretty comfortable and confident that they've they know then you know what they need to do and then they they go off and, and carry on without me um I'm not the kind of practitioner that stays with somebody for weeks and months and months um from my experience you know that that's not needed i just help them figure out the the blend you know energy management which is often called pacing um you know any mindset related um uh things that i can help them with to get into that much more um determined and hopeful place and some other practical things um but but the first step would be to just understand, I get into their life with them and understand mm. what 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 kind of life they need to live at the moment, yeah. um, because that's the priority. Is first of all getting them to a place where life today feels a bit more achievable, a bit easier, and they're getting a bit more consistency. And from there, we can talk about how then to help them give give their their system the best chance in in you know, starting to move up and up and lift out of what's going on. That sounds amazing. So when you work with them and you say like you don't stay for them months and weeks, so is it, do you just look each week how many more sessions you're going to have or do you work with a set structure that is adaptable with each person or how? how yeah, that I mean, I, I always encourage somebody to commit to at least three sessions with me if we're working one-to-one -one. um because you know yeah as I say to people I'm good but there's not much we can do in only one and yeah, uh, two, two sessions is also a bit of a uh, a funny sort of cadence you know because then they've had a good session they come back and then that's it so three we you know it, we can start to achieve some really good things mm -hmm. in, in even only three sessions and then at the end of that we'll talk honestly about whether they might want to um, carry on and add on another couple of sessions another two or three but it's usually it averages about that sort of number you know maybe five five or six sessions with people um that's amazing and that's not you know, much at, at that, no no I mean I I um I, I'm, and then I'm there if they need me and, and, and often they'll come yeah. they'll come back every month or two maybe once they've achieved uh, a bit of a shift as I call it and they've got a whole new set of because I say to people pacing or, you know, um, uh, fatigue, you know, management, it's it's life is a series of it, every day is a series of problem solving. You know, you wake up and it's about getting through the day, problem solving your way through until, you know, you've got to the end of it and you can we can head off to bed. So once you get to new stages, um, the, the, there's often a whole set of new things that you need mm -hmm. to sort of start to um to tackle interestingly you know one thing I've I've noticed over the years is that when people are you know when people are actually doing 
considerably well you know they're back to a place where they might be back at work a bit you know, you know they're able to socialize a bit they're you know they've got a good semblance of their life back often that bit is tougher for them to navigate practically and um emotionally than than the early stage and I do oh, you know I, I find the right ways to leave them with that knowledge when we stop working together and and at the time you know they're looking at me and going what do you mean it's going to feel brilliant when I'm back doing that it'll be great I'll be fine you know it'll be easy to deal with but quite often they do come back and go mm, yeah actually could, could we just have another one off just so you can help me figure it I think it's you know, psychologically, once you start to get a bit of your life back, um, there's a whole new level of acceptance about, you know, being at peace with the fact that that's wonderful, but you've still got to be smart and, you know, you've got to manage the fact that you can start to do little bits of things again, but you can't necessarily do everything that you'd want to do. Mm -hmm. So, but on the whole, um, I would stay with somebody for a few, a few sessions uh, they might pop back to see me every now and then. Um, and then, you know, it's it's uh, down to them then. Because as I say to people, I can give them all of the most helpful guidance and advice that I, I think they need. But at the end of the day, it comes down to, you know, each person to, you know, build the, the daily discipline, the habits, do the, the problem solving every day and, and make it work, um, yeah. which which is a tough bit. I think many people are surprised at quite how much effort we all have to put in to getting through something like this. You don't just sit yeah, around and wait to get better. Yeah. And um, do you want to explain a little bit how pacing works? Does it just mean don't overdo everything or is it a bit more complex than that? So, you know, I, I can give a lot of guidance and help with that bit um, because... What I recognised from my own journey, but certainly having helped, you know, lots and lots of people now, is that people hear about the importance of pacing, and and it is, it's really important, um, but they don't. They often people think it's a it's a mindset, it's it's something to be aware of as they carry out their day. Mm -hmm. um, I absolutely now suggest that it needs to be much more than that. It needs to be okay. a, a structure, a framework you know, a method that somebody applies every day in order to, you know, figure out how to get through the day in the best possible way. You know, um, I describe it as it's um, it's figuring out how much energy you've got today um, mm -hmm. so that you can make smart decisions about what to use it on. Yeah. You know, and some days, the days will be full of things you have to do. So you prioritize those things and it's about figuring out how to do them with your available energy. Some days you might have a bit of capacity to do um, some of the things you want to do um, rather than it just being, you know, the, the more the more critical things. Yeah. That sounds really good. I, I'm so fascinated and baffled still that it's mainly like between three and six sessions and then people have well, something I mean, they can not, work with. Yeah, I think that's a really important, you know, as I say, I'm here. I pick people up who are feeling, um, you know, uh, lost, bewildered, uncertain. They've lost their hope. You know, they, they just don't know how on earth to get. It. So I pick people up from that place. And yeah. it takes about, five, you know, five or six sessions to get them into a place where they're feeling mm -hmm. they've got some of the answers now. They know what they need to do. They've got that confidence back. They've got things they can do, yeah. which just didn't itself starts to feel so much better because it can feel like such a passive um health challenge to to uh, work with where nobody can tell yeah. you what to do there are yeah. no treatment protocols there are no set time scales and prognosis there are no you know facts and figures and answers you know and that feels very passive and and and, and as if you're on the back foot so I help people just figure out, you know, the, the practical things, the tools and techniques. It's real things that they can apply in the moment, mm. every day, that will start to make things feel better. It's that bit that I help with. And we've talked about my one-to-one -one coaching, but I also um, do a group program 
where it's oh. it really is it's that bit it it's my yeah. three-week fatigue rescue I don't know if you've seen me talk about that but yes it's in three weeks they get my best advice and guidance on that that early bit you know the package of things that blend mm -hmm. to to move forward and although it's a group session it's a small group and together we were you know I help them figure out what their blend is it's not a a one size here do all of these things I we, you know I help them figure out which of those things are going to be most helpful for for them and yeah I see people you know leaving uh, after working with me whether it's one-to-one -one or in the the group program just looking so much more confident and and positive and hopeful and as we said earlier that in itself makes starts to make a difference yeah I can imagine that's wonderful and it's probably another not so easy to answer question. How many recover? Do most people recover? Is it very different? Is it? Gosh, I mean, I've helped over Can you even answer that? Now. I mean, I, I've helped see. hundreds of people. And of course, you know, I rely on the ones that keep in touch. So out of those 500, yes. I'm probably only still in active contact with, uh, say, 100 of them. Um, mm. And because of the length of some of the journeys that, that people go through, you know, um, some of them haven't quite achieved full recovery yet, but are they doing much, much, much better than they were? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Do I have, you know, scores of positive uh, and inspirational stories about people that have got properly back? Yeah, absolutely. Um, do I think it's possible? Yes. Um, so, you know, and I, I don't give, it's not my place to give, false promises or or what have you but I absolutely encourage the person to to promise themselves that even if they're not going to you know fully recover I mean what does fully recover even mean M most people recalibrate what their idea of being back is um in any case and so that's what I talk about it's about getting back to where you want to be um and yeah I see people doing that every month easily every month that's amazing so i've actually just got one last question is there anything we haven't talked about which you think is good to mention anything you want to share with people who are watching this before we wrap up this episode gosh let me think I think I think the key thing is that although we've touched on it, we haven't um, talked in much detail today about the the more kind of the mindset, the the more emotional side of coping with a a, um, a health challenge like this. And I, you know, I think that the key messages I would give there is are, um, you know, don't get caught up with the lack of answers, the lack of you know hope that you'll hear perhaps from some of the the experts. Don't don't um, get too caught up on uh, where the gaps are between where you are today and where you want to be. Recognize recognize the small improvements. Recognize when even you're just getting into a slightly more positive and accepting place, so that you can um, figure out how to go forwards. Um, I think that's a really important message for people. Gosh, is it easy for me to say that and 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 tougher. To achieve yeah. um, some people can figure that out themselves some people need to talk to somebody like me other people might recognize that they actually need um, perhaps to talk to a counselor or, or a therapist in that space but an interesting thing I I am um, I run a, a private support group for people that have worked with me one-to-one mm -hmm. -one. it's only for people that have worked with me it's it's that middle ground for when we've we finished the kind of the sessions but they don't want to be completely um yeah. uh, left to their own devices it just gives them that kind of a space where they can still come and, and talk to me anyway um I was talking to a few people in there and I asked them what's the most important thing for you what has helped you get back to where you were is it the mindset stuff or the practical mm -hmm. you know pacing nutrition all of that stuff and they said the mindset but yeah. um because you could be doing all of the right things when it comes to the, um, the the practical stuff, but if you're still not in the right frame of mind, you you just won't stick with it 
as yeah. much as anything. And it just, you know, they're both important, but um, I think it's recognizing the importance. And to be honest, people, you know, even just watching, uh, you know, YouTube channels like yours and, and some of the others that are out there where they're sharing um, inspirational, helpful, positive uh, content, that can be hugely helpful in itself. Yeah, very true. Whatever works. Yeah, that's wonderful. And I can so, yeah, I can so relate to what you just said. The mindset is really, really important. And for me, even though my recovery, the physical side of the recovery was a very abrupt solution, I don't think it would have happened that way if I wouldn't have been in the mindset I was in, which was already fully focused on my life and fully filling my dreams and actually being happy. So I think that's a wonderful way to end this episode with the last really strong message. And so for everyone's watching, we're going to have your details in the description. So if anyone saw this and feels like they would love to talk to you, um, hopefully they do reach out. <laughs> yeah, well, I would love to hear from them. And I, you know, I'll, I'll keep an eye out for comments and, and reply to any. But please always feel free to drop me an email um, or reach out in some way. Um, and uh, I, I do, I get great joy from being back and, and helping others get back now. Um, and it's been, it's been lovely to talk to you a bit about it today. That's fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's been really inspirational. I'm looking forward to having this published, this published and I hope it, it can help a lot of people. So thank you so, so much for your time. And uh, yeah, I hope the technical side didn't make it too hard to watch. But again, the audio was good. And so even if it might be a bit chittery, I think it was... And you might, you, yeah, you might want to sort of say to people, this is more like a podcast <laughs> episode than a visual one. It's not like there's anything particularly, um, you know, it's only us, isn't it? Exactly. Once you've seen what we look like, it's not really that important to... Thank you so much for watching this episode. I hope you took a lot from it. I really enjoyed my conversation with Pamela and I think she is a wonderful, inspiring person and what she does is hugely important. Again, little reminder, if you want to get in touch, please don't hesitate. Her contact details are in the description. She also, as you heard, just offered to keep an eye on comments. So if you feel like commenting on the video, please do so. See you next time.